Greetings, comrades, and welcome back to Chatter and Skull. And this week, we've got yet another jam-packed episode for you guys. Today, we're going to be talking about what everybody is talking about, unfortunately, which is the EA apocalypse. And thankfully, as funny and as interesting as this whole little incident has been, it's going to give me the opportunity to talk about something that I've been wanting to talk about on the show, which is the fact that our political climate is fundamentally changing. And a lot of people, particularly on the right, are not prepared for that. So before we get to this cluster of epic proportions, let me give you a little bit of background. And let me explain how I have divvied up the political eras that I have seen so far in my lifetime. I'm going to bring you on a journey, the journey of my lifetime. And this will help me frame where we are today and how this is relevant to our conversation so I would say I have, probably most of you have, lived through about six distinct political eras. So I was born in 1989. That's where our timeline starts. Obviously, Comrade exists. And I was born at the end of what I call the late Cold War period. That takes from the beginning of Reagan's presidency all the way to the fall of the Soviet Union. That's what I consider the late Cold War period that is typically associated with the kind of politics you associate with the Roaring 80s type of thing. But that ended in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union, and this begins the second political era which I lived through, and this was definitely before I had my political awakening. So I remember this time as a kid, but I don't really remember being engaged in the politics of the era so after 1991, the USSR falls, the Cold War ends, and this begins what I call sort of the 90s golden era, where things seem like we might actually enter that utopian human dream type of thing, where everybody's getting along, there's not a lot of conflict, America's the clear power, it's the clear dominant force, and things seem to be relatively peaceful. We got a lot of great media, we got a lot of great movies, TV shows, video games from this era, a lot of great stuff, but all of that changed when 9-11 happened. And this begins what I call the Team America age. And this is, of course, the War on Terror age. This is probably the time, this is the time where I became very politically active, very much so engaged with what's happening, very much so against what America was doing in the world, against the war in Afghanistan, against the war in Iraq. And I think a lot of you guys also became politically active in this time frame. This was the era that started both the Iraq and Afghan war. The Afghan war only wrapping up last year, almost a 20-year conflict. So I feel like it's the Team America age that really blundered a lot of the advantages that America had going into the 21st century. In this age, they made a lot of poor, I think, geopolitical decisions. They spent a lot of money on frivolous things. They wasted a lot of material, a lot of soldiers' lives, and they made large sections of the world hate them. So I think this was a pretty rough time for America, the Team America age. And eventually, it did come to a close when we had the president who really headed this era, of course, George W. Bush, on his way out. And of course, at the end of his presidency, we had another major political event that would, of course, change the course of politics for the next little while. This is, of course, 2008. This is the Great Recession, the subprime mortgage crisis, the collapse of the American economy, huge amounts of wealth just wiped out in a very short period of time, people jumping out of windows when they would see their life savings just disappear. Obviously, this was a very difficult time. This was the beginning of Barack Obama's presidency, and I would say probably the first real task that he had as president was dealing with the Great Recession. And what this era really did is bring, I think, a new era into the anti-capitalist side of the political spectrum. You were finally having a event that we can point to or we can say that capitalism has gone way too far. It's ruining people's lives. At the beginning of the 90s, it really seemed like this way this neoliberal neoconservative form of capitalism was going to be indisputably in charge for quite some time and it, it still is and still may limp on but 2008 was the first time that it had a real crisis and people could see that there are cracks forming in the system and we should think about coming up with alternatives 
This was, of course, the era where you got things like Occupy Wall Street, a lot of people really thinking about new and different systems and new and different ways of interacting with the world that we have. All of that kind of ended, and it didn't end like a lot of these other ones with a big serious event or anything. It just seemed like the Great Recession faded out of political memory and people started focusing on other things. We're at a point where the recession has recovered enough to where people are feeling more comfortable. They aren't as worried about the floor falling underneath them and they start to spend their political energies on other things. And I feel like this transition to what I call the silly era really happened in 2014. This is the era where things like the SJWs and the anti-SJWs and the culture war and the, all this stupid bullshit really came to the fore of the political debate. And we spent almost all of our time talking about a lot of silly nonsense issues which really didn't have any benefit to anyone one way or the other. And I feel like this silly era it really broke a lot of people's brains, right? It, they really broke a lot of uh, the way they see politics. Now they always will frame it through these weird, silly culture war ideas rather than through actual like legitimate policy proposals to benefit people's lives. Politics becomes more about owning the other side rather than promoting your own ideas because your ideas on both sides are not exactly popular. They're not embraced by the population at large. And a lot of people think that politics has really just become a silly, stupid game. And I am personally really happy that I checked out in the silly era of politics. At least I wasn't really out there talking publicly or anything like that. Because, I again, I feel like it broke a lot of people's brains and they haven't been able to escape this era of politics. And they're, they're very much so stuck in the silly era and that goes for both the left and the right but i do think the right is more stuck in that silly era of politics because they found more success during that era they found more success when they were fighting the culture war when they were talking about this woke stuff and calling out the woke scolds or whatever this was a really good time for conservatives especially at a time where it seemed like their ideology was really struggling Figures like Donald Trump came along and injected an energy into the party, which I hadn't seen in a while. Unfortunately, with him came a sort of a poison pill, if you will, because Donald Trump and the anti-SJW politics were successful in the silly era. We don't live in the silly era anymore, and a lot of people haven't come to grips with that. I don't exactly know what to call the era of politics that we're living in now, Right now, just as a placeholder, I'm calling it the serious era in opposition to the silly era because essentially the pandemic came along and things got really serious really fast and people jettisoned a lot of the silly political arguments that they were standing on for a while. Some people started recognizing the seriousness of the situation and adjusting their politics accordingly and others did not. And the people who have not have suffered greatly. As you can see, I don't think that this type of silly era conservatism has a lot of weight in the new serious era. The conservatives need to jettison a lot of that talk if they want to succeed. And this is something that we saw in 2020. We we're seeing that Donald Trump's silliness cannot survive the serious era of politics. 2022, in the midterms, once again, we saw the Republicans try to forward a lot of silly policies things like culture war issues, things like election fraud, a lot of nonsense bullshit that people didn't really care about when they're actually suffering. And then since the pandemic, we've only seen that seriousness escalate with, of course, the war in Ukraine, and who knows how it's going to escalate even further. I've talked to you guys before. I think this is going to be a pretty shaky decade. I think this is going to be the decade of most transformation that we see in our lifetimes. So let's buckle up and get ready, boys, because it's going to be a rough one. And the politicians who are not recognizing that are failing. And this is a much worse issue for conservatives because their ideology essentially believes that we can't change society. That society needs to stay the same. We can't change the hierarchy. We can't change how we do things. If we do change, it has to go back to a previous version of the way things are. 
So when things do seem to be going well, like they were in the silly era, you can use those silly politics to make fun of people taking things seriously. But when things are actually serious and you're trying to make fun of people who are taking things seriously, you basically look like a, a psychopathic clown, essentially. And some conservatives are learning that they are entering a new political era and are trying to transition some of the issues that they had success with in the silly era into the serious era and trying to push that forward. So let's take a very clear-cut example of that, and then we'll go into the apocalypse, which is transgender people. If you remember back in the silly era, the conversation was like, oh, it's silly to identify as something under the other than your prescribed gender. If you can do that, I can prescribe, identify as an attack helicopter or a man this day, woman that day, blah, 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 blah. You've heard all this kind of crap before. But nowadays... When was the last time you heard a conservative say something stupid? Oh, I identify as an attack helicopter. <laughs> for me personally, it's been a long time because that issue for them is no longer in the silly era. People like Matt Walsh have tried to escalate it to reflect the serious era of politics that we're living in now. And we've talked about this before. They try and escalate it with arguments like, won't you think of the children, that trans people are coming for your kids, they're trying to turn them trans, that of course they're, they're grooming your kids. This is the way that they take a silly issue to them and try and make it serious to most people. Because, and I, this is definitely going to sound harsh, and it's not as harsh as it's meant to be, that in eras of struggle and strife, most people do not care about trans issues, they do not care about LGBT issues, and that goes for both positively and negatively. So in the sense that they don't care about enhancing their lives and supporting their rights, yeah, that's true, but they also don't care about this idea. They don't think trans people are trying to groom your kids. They think that's a bunch of nonsense. They don't think that trans people are coming to get you. They don't think that they're evil or anything like that. They just think that they're a type of people out there going about their lives. And I think that when things start to get worse for everyday people, they don't focus on people who aren't maybe in their immediate surroundings, start to focus more on themselves and more on their own individual outlook and how things are going to hopefully improve in their own lives or worry about how things might get worse. So at that point, unfortunately, when it comes to trans issues, the vast majority of people just don't care and they're just not engaged. Seeing this, the conservatives have tried to escalate the rhetoric to try and bring those normies back into political engagement. And personally, I don't think it's working. Again, when I go out into the real world and I talk to people, even in an area that is very conservative here in Alberta, people by and large, they aren't thinking about the trans grooming your kids. They're thinking about issues much closer to home. And when conservatives bring this up and they continue to push this drum, it makes people think that they're clowns rather than actually think that they're seriously trying to benefit their lives. Because no normal person out there thinks that their life is going to be better if, you know, they canceled Drag Queen Story Hour. Most people understand that this isn't going to affect their lives in any way, shape, or form. And that we actually need to be talking about serious economic issues, serious pocketbook issues about how people are going to keep afloat in an era where it gets harder and harder for a person to sustain their way of life. And all of this finally brings us to the apocalypse because I think that what we're seeing with Kanye West's anti-Semitism rising to absurd and insane degrees is we are seeing conservatives try and take an issue from the silly era and drag it into the serious era. And this is, of course, the anti-Semitic Jews run the world conspiracy theory. And this is a very old conspiracy theory. And I can't believe that in my lifetime, it is getting so much clout and so much attention to the point where one of the most popular and recognizable musicians in our cultural world goes on one of the most popular and recognizable political podcasts and 
they just have free reign to spew anti-Semitic shit. And then, of course, when Kanye gets the tiniest amount of pushback on his crazy ideas, he jets, he just leaves. And I'm sure you guys know what happened. We're going to watch the clip right here in a second. Just to give you guys a bit of context, I don't want to go too much into this because I feel like this is such a big thing that most people probably know what's going on. But uh, long story short, Kanye, now Ye, he is going crazy. He's gone deep into these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and he's going on anywhere that he can to basically try and prop this up and uh, promote his own views. So he went on to the Tim Pool show, the Tim Cast, of course, an individual who's on my right-wing roster and who is very influential in right-wing circles, maybe not so much anymore, we will see after this incident. But even people on the right were apparently telling him that this is a bad idea because not only did Ye come along, he came along with two of his neo-Nazi cronies, Milo Yiannopoulos and Nick Fuentes, who is probably, I would say he's probably the worst white supremacist that currently has a platform on the internet right now. This guy is fucking awful. His ideas are junk. He basically freely admits that he does not want a democracy. He does not want people to vote because his ideas suck and he recognizes that people aren't going to vote for them. So he unironically wants a dictatorship to usher in the era of golden Christian nationalism. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's watch this here. I think they've been extremely unfair to you. I Who was they though? We can't Cor say who they Cor is, Corporate can we? Press. I'm not using the, I don't, I don't use the word as the way I guess you, you guys use, I'm, I'm talking about- It is about them though, isn't it? Because when you think <laughs> about it, consider it. In 2018- What do you mean it's not? What, what, okay, so how about, are you leaving? <laughs> are you afraid of the press? <laughs> He's gone. I'll say it right now. You, I, you guys want to bring that stuff up? And then have think the we're discussion. not going to not going to have a like, conversation. Like have the discussion. Like you, you think he, yeah, he's going to come in here and say, "Here's my pain, here's my suffering." I'm going to say, "I hear you." And then he's going to say, "And it was Jewish people." And I'm going to be like, "Okay, but don't you consider it?" So I'm not going to do this. I, I refuse. Go, uh, make sure he's cool. All right, go for it. I think they've been extremely. <laughs> so there you guys go. That's the clip. My personal favorite moment is like when he gets up and then some guys, are you afraid of the press? What does that even mean? Like, what the fuck? I don't know why that just cracks me up. Anyway, there are so many amazing things about this. Right-wing people online are exploding over this. Everyone's angry at Tim Pool. Lefties are having a field day. We're laughing our asses off at this whole nonsense. And it is great. It's great to watch this craziness unfold on the right. Especially because, to borrow a right-wing term, everybody from this little encounter ends up looking like a beta cuck. Everyone. Kanye looks like a beta cuck because he runs at the first semblance of pushback. Tim looks like a beta cuck because he doesn't even really push back. He has like the most limp dick, tepid pushback against Kanye and his craziness that you could ever imagine. If he's going to push back, at least fucking push back, dude. At least actually do something. Don't just be like, maybe they isn't the th same day that I think it is, or excuse me, that you think it is. Please, Mr. Kanye, sir. And then, of course, Milo looks like a beta cuck because he runs out too the first moment. He's like, oh, I gotta make sure he's cool. I gotta go calm him down. Just great stuff. And I am shocked at how quickly the right, at least the far right, is going full-on mask off anti-Semitism. And I want to know, do these people think that they can actually win, like, politically, like, in an election? Do they think that Kanye can actually become the president of the United States in the year 2024? Do they actually think that their ideas are popular with the people, that people actually think that these are good and valuable and will bring society to a better place? One of the things I do think that we're seeing out of the midterms is I think a lot of people, particularly on the far right, are realizing that they don't have the cultural sway that they used to. They've lost the kind of cultural cachet they've built up since 2016. And they are realizing that people don't actually like their ideas. They don't like the things that they have to say. And they don't want to see people like you in positions of power. And as a result of this, some people on the right are saying, okay, it's time to retool our message. We've got to look into ourselves and figure out a new message. And the other people, the true believers on the far right are saying, okay, 
now we're just going mask off. There's no point in even hiding this stuff anymore. We're just going to go full anti-Semitism, full authoritarianism. We're going to advocate for dictatorship to bring about our ideas because we think that you're all evil and that you should all die if you're on the left, that is. I genuinely believe that Nick Fuentes wants me to die. Like, I think that if you were to give him a truth pill and ask him if he wants me or any other leftist to die, if he had a button that he could push that would eliminate all of us off the planet, he would push that button in a second. And the big difference between a guy like me and Nick Fuentes is that I do not want Nick Fuentes dead. I don't want him purged, nothing like that. But you'll see this trope on the right uh, that the pull out that the leftists, the socialists, they secretly want to put us all in re-education camps and take us all and purge us or whatever. Total nonsense. Again, this is mainly just projection of what they want. This is projection of what they believe that they want if they were ever in power to round up people that they don't like, people that they disagree with politically, and at the very least neutralize their political power and in some extreme cases neutralize their personhood entirely. So yeah, the true believers, they're just going full bore. They're saying now is no longer the time for hiding what we believe. We're just going to go for it. And whatever is going to come is going to come. All right. So let's go and look at some of the comments underneath this video. And we can see how people are reacting to how Tim did in this interview. And I know a lot of other people have been doing this, but there's a reason because it's just, it's amazing. It's funny. And it's a great way to get a deeper look into some of the binds of these people. So one thing I've decided to do is change the YouTube theme to a dark background because I think it works better with the green screen and the show as a whole. And I'm probably going to be trying to change things into dark backgrounds going into the future. But what do we have here? In any case, this one here has 1.5k likes. Tim said the black vote, yet when EA implied there was a Jew vote, but didn't even have to say it. You could feel the tension build and the feeling of something of something wrong it was very interesting. Next one here is that this one has 3.8K likes. Tim has three massive guests. I don't know, I would say one massive guest and wants to talk about the daily news. Isn't that what your show is about? I can't believe I could, I'm gonna say it, but for one episode, Tim should have really let Ian take the lead. I don't think that would ever happen. I'm pretty sure Tim hates Ian's guts. At least that's the way it comes off every time we watch the show because all he ever does is yell at him and tell him how wrong he is. We've heard Tim's takes on everything a thousand times. How about letting us hear someone else for a change? Man, yeah, I'm sure you really wanted to hear what he had to say. The Mile episode was great because the guests actually got to speak and we learned about his opinions. This show has become more about the host and less about the guests. Tim wants to be the centerpiece. I think that's true. I think Tim definitely has an ego problem and a growing ego problem. Yay. A saying, I don't care about your opinion to Tim was just chef's kiss gold. Tim built his cult compound for there to be only for there to be only his way or the highway. Kanye has too much clout to suffer his insecure compliance to the center. So he left him talking to his obedient pets. Tim blew it. Dude, yay, hate hearing, smash that like from people with over 1 million subs. What a queen. Tim, anyone else? go from totally stoked about this podcast to sheer and utter disappointment in mere moments. Ye want to have a conversation. Tim wanted to have a debate. I don't even think he wanted to have a debate. It didn't even sound like he wanted to have a debate. He was just like, thank you. I'm not 100% on board with the whole Jewish conspiracy thing. Oh, that, that, you're debating me. That's a debate. You are pushing back. Gone. Out of here. Ye speaks the truth. A hundred. <laughs> yeah. So what you want to believe, man. For over an hour, Tim cannot shut about how Ye was wrong and he was right. It's complete amateur hour at the castle tonight. This is why you need good producers. This was Tim's peak and he blew it. Tim was scared he'd get canceled. So he pushed back. Let the man talk. He's bigger than your show. He's the only reason people tuned in. <laughs> Tim should book both Adam and Lydia as his next guest pairing. I've heard a little bit about that drama. I don't want this to devolve into the personal drama channel or anything like that, because this is not what I'm about. I'm about actual like political machinations and actually political ideology and wanting to win and promote my politics in the wider world. This is what this show is about. But <laughs> on the same token, it's hard not to talk about this kind of stuff because it is some juicy drama 
I'll let you guys know what I know basically, which is that if you guys don't know that when Tim started his Timcast IRL show, he had a different host, some guy by the name of Adam Krigler. They had a falling out and Adam left the show. I left Timcast to start his own show. And there's a lot of speculation as to why this is, what happened, what Tim said, what did he do? Recently, they had this the, these big changes in terms of Adam did this big thing about what happened. Tim responded with it, and then Adam responded, and blah, 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 blah. Long story short, the main sticking point seems that Adam didn't think Lydia, who is Tim's producer, was a very good producer. He thought that she was there basically to try and ride off Tim's coattails, gain clout, that sort of thing, rather than actually do a good and professional job. I'm not going to speak to that in any way, shape, or form. I have no idea if that's true, reliable, whatever, or if it's just personal beef. Either way, this is the type of drama which has been simmering underneath the Timcast for a little bit. And then, of course, we have this whole incident which just adds fuel to the fire. Although, that being said, Tim should definitely book Adam and Lydia as his next guest pairing. That would be hilarious. I'll never forget when Ian brought up the Belfort Declaration and Tim went to immediate shut it down moan. Okay. Came for the best interview of the year. Watched Tim smother it in the crib. <laughs> it was killing me. Biggest interview of his life and he couldn't even introduce Ye properly. Man. Okay. Just a couple more here, guys. This is getting a little bit too... We're getting a little bit too much into the weeds here. So let's just read two or three more. Tim always needs to be the smartest person in the room and he can only achieve it when he is the only person in the room. Oh, that's a solid burn. That's a good burn, buddy. I like it. Let's see if we can find the three most banned people had a meeting with Trump and Tim act like he has any room not to let them speak. Like he is even close to their level of inside info and understanding. He's a straight, insecure little man. Let's see if I can find one really crazy one here to wrap it up. Every single person has, every single person who has done this to me along the way has been Jewish. Okay, but it's not them though. The man brought you the receipts and you refuse to look at them. Keep arguing in La La Land. And of course, he's going to get up and leave. You can't have a conversation about this. And you really thought you were going to gaslight Ye, Nick, and Milo at the same time. We got a new crazy anti-Semitic one we can end this with. There are so many people on here watching the show that basically just wanted him to lick Kanye's asshole and just accept all the crazy shit that he said because this validates all the crazy shit that they believe. Before we end our current event segment and go into our monologue once again, continuing our discussion about verbal judo and how that can help you articulate your ideas and discuss and debate and persuade people, let's go to this tweet here by our good friend Jordy Peterson and what he says are Jews are the canaries in the social coal mine. When anti-Semitism becomes a moral necessity, even in its subtler forms, hell is about to make an appearance yet again. And of course screenshot has when anti-semitism becomes a moral necessity highlighted with little wtf underneath it which is a serious wtf moment i really want jordan peterson to explain more deeply what he means by when anti-semitism becomes a moral necessity and here's the thing about guys like jordy and tim pool or whatever and that is they are the figureheads of this movement but they aren't the ideological progenitors. The ideological progenitors are still the grassroots. And the grassroots buy into this anti-Jewish conspiracy. So if you want to continue to cultivate a audience of these type of people, you need to essentially go full bore Nazi at this point. And the real tragedy here is even if Jordy stopped post, Timmy decided to uh, shut down his show, there would still be people shameless enough to fill that anti-Semitic gap because they realize that these people are highly motivated, they're easily led, and they will give you a ton of money if you validate their insecurities and crazy conspiracy theories. So even if we were to defeat these guys in the battlefield of ideas, which we are very clearly doing, and they were to go away or change their mind or come back as left-wing people, whatever you want to say, that isn't going to solve the issue because we haven't dealt with this underlying bubbling anti-Semitism in the far right. And if you get rid of these figureheads, someone shameless enough will fill that gap because they see a niche that needs to be filled. So from a political sense, 
the way the right is going is good for people on the left because they are going into full bore crazy town. And I want to do a episode where I think that I think this may, maybe I'll do this next week for the 10th episode where basically I deliver my thesis on why I think conservatives are the new SJWs that they are falling into all the tropes that they spent all their time arguing against. And they are slowly coming to terms with the fact that the majority of people don't agree with their agenda. So it is a scary time because these people who, if they do continue to push this, yes, they're going to be politically unsuccessful. However, they will also become politically more extreme and more motivated to gain political power outside of the system, outside of the electoral system that we have. And that to me is the really scary part going into the future. I don't think that these people can win in a general election. I don't think that these people can take over power, at least not the extreme ideologues that we have right here. I think maybe a more moderate version would definitely be more threatening, but I don't think that these extreme ideologues can win in a general election. So on the one hand, I'm torn. It's like, please keep acting like this. Please keep coming out, saying these crazy things. So people on the left can go out there and make these videos making fun of you. But on the other hand, I really worry where this extremism is going to lead in the future. We've already seen extremism lead to the deaths, the unnecessary deaths of innocent people last week with the Club Q shooting. Where is it going to go next? Where are these extremists going to strike next once they've realized and come to terms with the fact that they can no longer achieve power through legitimate electoral means. So anyway, that's going to bring us to the end of our current events segment, Crazy Times. I can't believe that this is happening, but what can you say? At least I'm here to talk about it with you guys, and at least we can all maybe derive a little bit of entertainment and pleasure that way as we watch the right spiral further and further into this hole of anti-LGBTQ, anti-Semitism, anti-left-wing, anti-basically anybody not them, and slowly eat themselves alive politically. And unfortunately, during that process, they're going to lash out, and they're going to hurt people. And this is the reason why I think we need to keep fighting this fight. So, in any case, let's wrap that up, and we will go into our monologue on verbal judo. All right, comrades, so let's start our last segment of the show. I guess it's our second to last segment, but either way, let's start here by going into our discussion on verbal judo. But before I get there, I do want to frame what we're going to be talking about by going and talking about the kind of people that conservatives target to bring over to their political movement and the types of tactics that they use to recruit those people. So I feel that people who are very vulnerable to recruitment for conservatives are young men who are struggling to find their way in the world. They may be struggling romantically. They may be struggling economically or career-wise. There could be a slew of struggles that they might have in their lives. And on top of that, they probably haven't heard very many compliments or good things said to them by other people, whether that's their family, their friends, educators, people in power, whatever you want to say. So they've probably spent most of their lives being shat on. And I think there's a real danger when left-leaning people come in and continue to shit on these people because all it is doing is reinforcing poor self-perceptions and leaves them vulnerable to the type of tactics that conservatives will use to recruit them over to their political position, which is essentially they, they act like a... It's very similar to the way a narcissist will recruit somebody to be in a relationship with. So they will essentially come to them, usually maybe a, a young man or what have you, and they'll essentially love bomb them. They'll give them that kind of compliments, that kind of validation, that, that kind of self-worth that they might not have had anywhere else in their life. And this obviously gets them very attached to the person who love bombs them. And then in response, what conservatives will do is taper that love back over time in the same way that a narcissist will is that they'll kind of pull back that love bombing bit by bit. And the only way you'll receive further love is if you slowly start to buy into their right-wing ideology. 
So it might start with someone like you might be a pretty politically centrist person. You might not have a lot of political leanings. Let's take an issue like transgender rights in society. And as a centrist, non-politically engaged person, maybe you haven't really thought a lot about that. It hasn't really been on your radar. You're not really familiar with the experiences of transgender people and how they might not have the same rights, freedoms, and access that cisgender people have. You probably haven't thought about these kind of issues. They're not super important in your everyday life. And then all of a sudden you meet this right-wing person, they kind of love bomb, you're starting to get along with them, whatever. And then they start talking about trans people. Maybe they don't open up with, you know, their absolute, totally crazy ideology, but they'll start to plant the seeds and start planting small anti-trans, anti-LGBT seeds in their heads. And the only way that the person now, the recruit, the, the person who's being targeted for recruitment will receive that love bombing is to basically slowly but surely start to buy into the right-wing ideology. So you'll receive love bombing after you start to buy into that anti-trans agenda a little bit. And like a trail of breadcrumbs, like a trail of Fruit Loops, over time, slowly the conservative will be trailing those little packets of love bombing over closer to the far right. And all of a sudden, you're at a point where basically you have to buy into the full anti-Semitic conspiracy theory in order to be accepted into the group, or they will kick you out. And essentially now you'll have even less love by society than you had before, because now not only are you to have the same issues that you had before, and now all of a sudden you're off on this island with all these crazy people who believe all these bigoted, awful things, and most average people don't want anything to do with you. So how does this relate to our topic today? What I want to talk to you guys about are different levels of engagement with people and what type of response is appropriate for each level of engagement. So when we're talking about somebody who may be politically neutral, like our young male friend here, when it comes to our engagement, the last thing we want to do is put up a wall of insults because essentially that will just close the door to that person to a left-wing political perspective, hopefully not forever, but maybe for a very long time. And I think that's personally something that I don't want, right? I don't want people to be turned off from left-wing politics. To relate this back to verbal judo, I want to talk about an anecdote that George Thompson brings up in the book which is where he talks about his first experiences on the street as a police officer. He talks about some of the very, in one of his first nights, he deals with a couple of very difficult people who insult him, who won't listen to him, that just basically are resisting arrest at every possible term. And what George ends up doing is basically bringing down the hammer on these people, right? He treats them very aggressively, goes hands-on, cuffs them up, whatever, and then takes them to jail. And then he does this a couple times throughout the night and he's feeling pretty good at the end of the shift. He goes home, he's feeling like he's done the right thing, essentially. And then he gets woken up the next day by a call from the chief of police telling him to come in and that they need to have a conversation. So initially he goes in to talk with the chief thinking that this is going to be accommodation for me. They're going to accommodate me for the good work that I did yesterday, so on and so forth. But what ends up actually happening is that the chief rips him a new asshole and basically tells him that everything he did the other day in the way of treating these people was wrong. He treated them too aggressively. Now, all of a sudden, because what had happened is that parents of the, of the son that they arrested or that he arrested basically came and complained to the chief of police that there was essentially a police brutality involved in this arrest. And like I said, as a result... Basically, he gets torn a new asshole and told that if he doesn't figure out better ways to deal with difficult people, he's going to lose his job. And George's big complaint at the time was that the chief didn't really give him any concrete examples for what this might look like. Basically, he just said, you need to use different tactics. You need to persuade people. You need to be more reasonable. So this started his journey to basically try and find a way to create a system to fill that gap. So how does this relate back to our conversation of wing people basically end up becoming George Thompson when dealing with young men who might be either centrist or leaning to the right 
essentially they come in hard and heavy and bash them down. And I am here to be the chief of police telling you guys that is not the most effective way to gain political power, to persuade people to actually increase our political movement, to increase the people who believe and subscribe to left-wing and socialistic ideology, that we need to figure out new ways and new tactics of talking to and communicating with people so we don't automatically turn them off. So how does this relate back to our conversation? It all comes back to what we talked about at the start of this segment, which is we want to be able to identify the state that people are in so we can match our communication style with them. And if we are dealing with someone who is not very politically engaged, potentially, we do not want to come at them very heavily and we do not want to come at them very aggressively because they are not in that kind of state. They're not in the fight state, potentially. And by coming at them aggressively, we will put them in the fight state. And that's not what we want. We want to be able to communicate with people on an empathetic basis, which is what we talked about earlier. And in the principles of verbal judo, they talk about tactical empathy, which is not necessarily agreeing with a person, but being able to put yourself in their shoes and see their perspective. And I've talked about this several times, this tactical empathy, because this helps us navigate somebody from their point of view over to ours. So the first thing I always like to do is ask questions and feel like where somebody is out to see where they are politically. And if they can actually have a conversation about politics, then I do want to have that conversation. And if they are not a politically engaged person and do not like to talk politics, at that point, I'm going to try and find other common ground that we can talk about, right? I'm going to try and find other subjects of discussion that we might be able to, uh, to have and avoid the issue of politics unless it comes up naturally. Because again, the last thing you want to do is push a non-politically inclined person away from your politics. And I think part of this and part of what I try and do with the show is to help people understand the conservative mindset better as someone who has had to live in a very conservative place and talk to a lot of conservative people, see how they think, see how they see the world, see what their philosophies really are. We need to be able to articulate their positions better than they can articulate it themselves. And honestly, it's it's not that hard. Conservative political ideology is not as, I, I, there's no way to say this without insulting. It's not as complicated as left-wing ideology there's generally speaking a lot more going on. A lot of conservative ideology goes back to protecting the way things are, or like I said, going back to a previous version of society, which is a lot easier to wrap your head around than potentially changing society for the better. So it's important to be able to understand and articulate the conservative mindset to be able to persuade people. And part of being able to articulate it is also being able to articulate the negatives in a way that doesn't sound condescending. If you want to have the fight, if you want to actually fight with people, then you should be looking for the people who are willing to fight. And these are the kind of people that Kyle Kalinske has a good term for these people, the TFGs, the uh, too far gones, the people who are essentially so embedded in the conservative ideology that there is virtually no way that they could ever be persuaded from it. They're all in, they're all in for their lifetimes, ride or die type of thing. And while I do think left-wing people have a tendency to overestimate the amount of TFGs there are, they do exist. There's no question that they do exist. And an important part of being able to communicate and persuade people is being able to differentiate the two. And just because somebody insults you know, left-wing ideology, insults left-wing people, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are TFGs by definition. In fact, one of the most important things, and we talked about this in the last episode, is to make sure to not respond to those kind of insults. This is probably one of the most powerful things that you can do as an individual when you're in a heated conversation and heated argument is to not respond to insults because insults are deployed basically to trigger you, to get you off track, to try and elicit emotional responses and derail you from the actual argument and the actual debate that's happening. If you can refuse to be provoked by insults, as a result, you can actually engage with people. Like I talked about before, 
there is a certain possibility that if you don't get trigged or whatever by conservative insults, they might actually end up respecting you more because you are able to eschew that stereotype that they see of left-wing people in their heads. So there's nothing more powerful and more diffusing to someone who's trying to insult you or bring you down than to just ignore it, than to not respond to it and not let them dictate the pace of conversation. However, the one thing you can't do is necessarily ignore questions. And that's something we talked about before. Ignoring questions is resistance, where defending yourself against insults, that's resistance, right? The precepts of verbal judo essentially let the insults fly right by us and let us continue to discuss the topic at hand. The difference between questions and insults, at least, is that a question can show that there is a good faith attempt to engage with the conversation. Not all questions are in good faith, but at least a question is more of an attempt to engage in a good faith way than an insult is. So the question is, what do you do if you've actually identified someone as a TFG? What are your options then? At that point, you can do pretty much whatever you want, to be quite honest. I haven't found a way to really bring over the TFGs to a left-wing political ideology. I have had a lot of success in talking to people who are not politically engaged and are politically neutral and helping bring them over, or people who are nominally right, or who are very right-wing and who hang around a lot of TFGs but aren't one themselves yet. However, when you actually decide this person's too far gone, there's nothing we can do. At that point, it's you can. Mo the, the thing I would advise the most is to just disengage, spend your time in a more productive manner. But if you want to have a little bit of fun, that's the time where you can have a little bit of fun to troll them, to poke fun at them. Who cares? There's no point in engaging in good faith with these people because they will never engage in good faith with you. So you may as well have some fun while you're doing it. But again, I just want to stress, just because someone seems angry, they're insulting you or left-wing ideology, that does not mean that they are a TFG. People who have had to endure a lot of negative feedback in their lives can oftentimes project that negativity out into the world at large. It's nothing personal against you. It's unfortunately how they've been brought up and how the world has treated them. But very rarely when we're having these conversations when we're having these debates whether it's with someone who's too far gone or not are people actually saying what they truly mean and what they truly believe because in stressful situations which usually debates and conflicts are people will default to stressful responses which don't really indicate what they're actually feeling it just indicates that they are feeling angry scared anxious whatever other stress response you might want to put in there. Perfect example is a Republican who is very anti-LGBT, but is actually gay themselves. They might say all of these vile anti-LGBT insults, rhetoric, whatever you want to say, not because they actually believe it, but because they're afraid of their own sexuality and they want to do everything they can to try and crush it or pretend that it doesn't exist. The anti-LGBTQ rhetoric is a stress response to the fact that they haven't figured out their own sexual identity and that they don't feel comfortable in their own sexuality. Obviously, this doesn't validate their horrific actions in any way, shape, or form. It's just important to know that a lot of this rhetoric is born from a place of insecurity and fear, not necessarily a place of confidence and a true grasp of what's happening in the world. So the important things I want you guys to take away from this segment is I do want to reiterate, don't respond to insults. It's a bad idea. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's much more beneficial to your mental health and of actually persuading people to let those insults just roll away. And when you're talking to somebody who may not be very politically active or only tepidly politically active, make sure you're not coming in at them hard and heavy because all that does is have the potential to force them away from you and towards the people you don't want them to be with. So going into next week in our last segment on verbal judo, I'm going to try and bring all of these together into some sort of comprehensive review where we can go over important questions that we can ask, different tactics that we can use to deal with arguments or questions or criticisms of socialism, left-wing policy, 
and how we can respond to those in a way which is not the way an earthbender would respond to them, but the way an airbender would respond to them. So that brings us to the end of our conversation on verbal judo for today. We're going to end on our feel-good story as we usually do. And this is one I've had in my back pocket for a little while, so I think it's about time that I brought it for you guys. This one's older. This one is from June of this year. And this is directly from the website of the university. This is what you see. Yeah, Riverside. So essentially what these scientists were able to do is create an artificial photosynthesis chemical reaction which allows plants to grow in the dark without sunshine. So you no longer need UV light or to create that chemical reaction in plants and grow them, which is obviously a huge advantage if we're able to grow plants without sunlight. It means we can grow plants virtually anywhere. We can grow them indoors. We can grow them in basements. We can grow them in gigantic warehouses, wherever. So obviously it opens up a whole ton of possibilities for a food growth. So let's read a little bit about what they had to say here and what they had to and uh, what they have discovered. Photosynthesis has evolved from plants for millions of years to turn water, carbon dioxide, and energy from the sunlight into a plant plant biomass in the foods we eat. This process is, however, very inefficient. Only about 1% of the energy found in sunlight ends up being in the plant. Scientists at UC Riverside and the University of Delaware have found a way to bypass the need for biological photosynthesis altogether and create food independent of sunlight by using artificial photosynthesis. So let's read a little bit about exactly what they're doing here. This process uses a two-step electroanalytic process to convert carbon dioxide, electricity, and water into accelerate, the main component of vinegar. And just to go back, an electroanalytic process is essentially using electricity to create things like carbon dioxide, to create energy to create the materials that plants use to fuel themselves. Basically, it's the process of taking energy and turning it into plant food. This process creates the acetyle. Sorry, guys. The acetyle. How the fuck do you pronounce this? Useless. Very useless. Fuck you. We're going to uh, Google Translate. Okay. That doesn't really help us very much for Japanese. Aceteto. Aceteto. Oh, that's what we're going to call it. No, we're not going to call it that. Acetate. Acetate. Okay, perfect. That's what we're calling it. Sorry for that bit of a diversion there. So anyway, acetate. My apologies. So let's go back. So anyway, it takes carbon dioxide, electricity, and water and turns it into acetate, the main food component in vinegar. Food producing organisms then consume the acetate to grow in the dark. <laughs> Combined with solar panels to generate electricity to power the electrocalitesis, this hybrid organic inorganic system can increase the conversion of efficiency of sunlight into food up to 18 times more efficient for some foods. With our approach, we sought to identify a new way of producing food that could break through the limits normally imposed by biological photosynthesis. So let's see if we can get a little bit more information as to what exactly happens here. So using a state of the art two-step tandem CO2 Electro electrosis setup developed in a laboratory, we were able to achieve a high selectivity towards acetate that cannot be assessed through conventional CO2 electrosis routes. So basically, <laughs> they're saying that their process has been more effective than other processes. It's very cool. I'm not an expert on this kind of chemistry or anything like that. But I do think that this is an incredibly cool development and an incredibly cool thing to be able to do. Experiments showed that a wide range of food producing organisms can be grown in the dark directly on acetate rich electrolyzer output, including green algae, yeast, fungal mycium that produce mushrooms. Producing algae with this technology is approximately fourfold more efficient than growing it photosynthetically. Yeast production is about 18 fold more efficient than how it is typically cultivated using sugar extracted from corn. By liberating agriculture from the complete dependence of the sun, artificial photosynthesis opens the door to countless possibilities for growing food under the increasingly difficult conditions imposed by anthropomorphic climate change, drought floods, and reduced land availability would be less of a threat to global food security if crops for humans and animals grew in less resource intensive controlled environments. Crops could also be grown in cities and other areas currently unsustainable for agriculture 
and even provide food for f future space explorers. Very cool. Basic, okay, this approach to food production was submitted to NASA's Deep Space Food Challenge, where it was a phase one winner. The Deep Space Food Challenge is an international competition where prizes are awarded to teams who create novel game-changing food technologies that require minimal inputs and maximize safe, nutritious, and palatable foods for long space missions. Very cool. So there you go. This is, again, like a little bit older of a story, but a huge technological advancement that I want to share with you guys. I find this stuff awesome. This idea that we talk a lot about food production in these feel good stories, because I think that there is a lot of really cool things coming out of this area that people, they don't really reach the mainstream consciousness very much. And I like, I hadn't heard anybody talking about this anywhere that I am the first person that I have seen to bring up something like this. And I, I can't believe it because to me, this is so unbelievably cool. This idea that we can really escape the binds of food production, which have really been, they've been an anchor on the neck of humanity ever since its existence. Our entire existence has been finding ways that we can create more food that is safer for us to consume. And now we're adding in the new caveat that we need to also make this food sustainable and produce it in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. And it seems like this could also fulfill that aspect. Very cool stuff in my opinion, but that is going to bring us to the end of our show. We're back here and don't have too much to say in our outro yet again. It was another great show. While I don't always enjoy talking about this kind of a culture war nonsense that we spent a lot of time talking about today, it's just one of those things that has permeated to the internet to such a degree that I feel almost obligated to talk about it. And I will say it's just one of those fun shit shows that we can all sit around and laugh at. So I don't expect there to be too many of this kind of stuff going into the future, but we'll see. You never know what will happen in the next week and what new stories and what new events can bring us together and we'll be able to talk about next week. And until that time, this has been Comrade signing off and you guys take care.